This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. For everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level, you came to the right place. I am your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, Chinese blogger, and is a self-made thousand heir. My co-host is John Pazden, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki, Sinospice.com, and was raised as an only child, which really annoyed his sister. Tones are definitely a challenging aspect of Chinese. In this episode, John and I discuss the four types of mistakes learners make with tones. If you're trying to up your tone game, then this one is for you. Guest interview is with Matthew Armstrong, who trains English teachers in China. He'll tell us his story of passing the HSK six without actually being at the HSK six level, as well as language learning insights he has learned along the way. All this and more. Let's get to it. Hey guys, I'm Jared Turner. Hey, my name is John Pazden. All right, John. Before we kick into this podcast, we have a review, and I'm so grateful for this review because it just made my day. All right, let's hear it. This comes from Talk Girl from New Zealand. She says, "So glad I found this podcast. The best podcast on Chinese language out there. The presenters are highly knowledgeable, and I think she was talking about you, John, and provide insights on how to take." Your Chinese to the next level, while informing us of the obstacles learners can experience. My favorite are the interviews they have with those who have mastered the language. Great content. Keep it up. Thanks, Talk Girl. Yeah, thanks a lot. That means a lot to us. Okay, so today we're going to talk about something that you really can't escape whenever you're talking about Chinese or learning Chinese. We're going to talk once again about tones,、uh, but we're going to talk about it in a way that we haven't really talked about it before. Uh, we talked before a little bit about the process of learning tones, but today we're going to talk a little bit about the types of tone mistakes people make because there are different types of mistakes you make.、Um, they correspond to your level. They correspond to your habits. It's not just an exercise in、uh, masochism here. There is a reason to understand these mistakes because you might not realize that you're sort of feeding into some of them. You know, John, I'm really glad that you are addressing this topic because honestly, before getting into this, I'm just like, oh, there's just a gazillion mistakes you can make. We're going to break it down into these clear categories of the different types of mistakes that are made. Right. So let's start with the first type, which is mistakes of control. So this is something that affects everybody、uh, really badly when you first start learning Chinese because you know your tones are all over the place. You can't hear the difference, or you can hear there's a difference, but you have no idea what it is. It takes you a bit of time to get familiar with them. And then it takes you more time to be able to even accurately reproduce one single tone, right? Yeah, this is a really good one because a lot of these it just take practice to get down properly. And even if you like on paper, you can see, oh yeah, this is like you know second third tone or a third second tone. It takes some time to get even familiar with this. Your mouth's just not you know, used to it, or you, you're still having a hard time even hearing it, even though you it doesn't sound right, but you're not sure what it is, and you just can't. Produce the right sound or the right tone. Yeah, and this kind of ties into what we were saying before about how there are levels just within this mistakes of control. Like in the beginning, just making a single tone correctly is difficult, and then once you do that,、uh, you know you can do first, third, fourth, second on command.、Um, that doesn't mean you can string two of them together. So then you have to improve your control to the point that you can do two in a row correctly. Right? We call this tone pairs. And just if you can do. A single tone pair that doesn't mean you can do all the others, and it doesn't mean you can always do it within the larger context of a sentence. So there's lots of fun to be had with this issue of control, and it's a long-term thing. Absolutely, and I'm really grateful that there are easier tone pairs than in others. I may have shared this story before, but when I first came to China, I lived with a, another guy who spoke Chinese really well. But we had an Italian roommate who also lived with us, and he didn't speak any Chinese, and. At the time, there was a little phone in our in the apartment where you could call the guard gate at the front, and you could call for a taxi. And my my roommate said to our Italian roommate who didn't speak Chinese, he says, "Just pick up the phone and call, say chu chu chu, and、uh, which is taxi." And he couldn't say it, but he said, "Just say like chu chu chu," and but just you know had the first tones. It's like chu 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 chu, just these first tones. And he just picked up the phone and he goes, "You chu chu chu." And lo and behold, a couple minutes later, a taxi showed up at our apartment, and it was it was pretty funny. But it was, it was a good example there of you know that was an easy one to control. But you know, had it been some other second, third, fourth tone mix up in in the words, and it probably wouldn't have gotten through. 
Yeah, I'm kind of surprised he was able to do it. Um, even though a bunch of first tones in a row is not that bad, it, it's still hard for a beginner. It, it is. It sure is. So to improve the control, you're going to need to hear it a lot. You're going to need to practice it a lot. You also need some feedback because sometimes you think you're doing it right, but actually you're not. It's all like a big long-term thing, uh, but it gets better over time. All right. What is our second mistake then? All right. So the second one is uh, mistakes of ignorance. This is pretty simple. If you don't know the tones, you're not going to get them right. Um, a lot of times people will guess at the tones, and that's fine if you really don't know them and you have no way of checking or whatever. But most of the time, you're going to get them wrong if you have to guess. There are also people who think that if they speak really quickly, that no one will notice that they didn't know the tones. <laughs> let me let you in a little secret, guys. That doesn't work. And I, I know this from experience. There, there's obviously times I've come across where, like, I remember the word, but I just don't know the tone. And I'm trying, I just, like you described, John, I try to say it real quick. And sometimes they understand, but sometimes they're like, what? What are you saying? Like, Shama. Do you want me to give you a little secret for that? Please do. Please do. Rather than fudging the tone and hoping they won't notice that you got it wrong because they will, pick a tone, you know, your best guess, and do it really clearly. And if you get it wrong, they will either totally not understand because your tone was so clear, that must be what you meant, right? Or they'll figure out what you meant and sometimes they'll correct you. Of course, then if you say a word, but you have the wrong tones and it means something else, like you're trying to say panda and you go xiong mao and you actually say chest hair, then that could be a problem. <laughs> but then you'll learn something, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> the hard way. And hopefully you won't forget that lesson. Right. But within this whole like mistakes of ignorance thing, there's an issue that I see a lot with my clients and with other learners. What happens is people, they start studying Chinese. They've been studying for a while. They might get to the level of intermediate and they know their tones are kind of bad, but, you know, that's kind of normal, right? And, and then when they get to studying with us, we'll tell them, hey, hey, you, you got to buckle down and get these tones right. We're going to help you. And they're like, okay, so they'll focus on it. But the problem is they, they know all these words that they've known for a long time, but they never knew the tones. They just knew the pinyin without tones. And so they kind of rely on a feeling or they just kind of guess and frequently they're wrong. So then they have to go back eventually and figure out. Which words do I not really know the tones for? And then what are the right tones? And then can I say them? And I think the point here is that there usually ends up being a lot of dictionary lookups, right? You're having to go back and check. You're like, is that the right tone? And I have done this before. I've gone into a situation and I knew a keyword or something I wanted to say, but I wasn't confident on the tone. So, you know, I pulled up my phone and pulled up Playco and I looked it up. And that obviously helps dispel that ignorance. Yeah, well, well, some people are in the habit of just kind of winging it and they feel like people always understand them so they don't really want to change that habit. Maybe you're getting it right and hopefully you can confirm that. But if you're not getting it right, it's something you really want to fix. Now that leads us to the third mistake. Okay, so I find this one to be one of the worst ones, mistakes of memory. So like you think you know the tone and you're confidently saying it and people are just like, what? And you're just like, did I get that wrong? Or, or even worse, you're confidently saying the tone and people understand you, but it turns out you're getting it wrong and you've been getting it wrong for years or months or <laughs> whatever. I have done that for a while. You know, the, the direction north, bay, uh, I used to think it was bay. And I would always be like really confident, be like, oh yeah, bay, bay, like really loud, you know, Beijing or whatever. <laughs> and, and people are just like, oh yeah, we understand you. And it took me forever to, to find out, wait a minute, it's actually bay. Oh man. It's, it's embarrassing, but uh, you got to find those mistakes of memory and get them. You know, I, I also think this is, could be mistakes of arrogance because sometimes you're, you're like, you're so convinced. No, no, no. That's the tone. I know it. I know the tone. I, I even recall one time my kids, when they were in a Chinese school, someone was asking in one of these chat groups, a parent was asking like, what's the tone for such and such word? Because they were like, I think it's this way, but my son says it's different. And then everyone in the chat group, all the parents were like, I, I'm not really sure. But it was kind of funny that, you know, that's a big thing that we focus on as Chinese learners, as learning this as a second language. So I pulled it up on my phone and I actually said it out to the chat group. And I said, oh, it's this tone for this word. And I was like, oh, thanks. But, you know, Chinese people, they don't actually memorize a lot of the tones. They just kind of have that feel for it. Right. And they just say it. So sometimes they don't even know. I don't know if you have this, John, you've asked a Chinese person, what's the tone for this character or this word and sometimes they're not so sure yeah that happens because i mean they didn't have to study the tones they just acquired them right they just learned them naturally i think this is something where um, a lot of people i don't know if it's a mistake exactly but a lot of times it's a method that doesn't really work and the method is 
I want to learn like a child. I want to immerse myself in the language. I don't want to learn tones, one, two, three, four. I want to just hear it so many times that it's just natural. And all I have to do is just say how it feels right and it'll be correct because that's how kids do it. In theory, that's totally possible, but you got to be immersed and you got to be immersed for many years because that'll work pretty well for the beginning vocabulary. But as the vocabulary you learn become more and more low frequency, you know, words that you don't hear every day, you're just not going to hear it enough for it to really make a really deep impression, especially if you're not in a Chinese language environment. And that's when you really do need to rely on looking up in a dictionary, seeing what the tones are, and then going from knowing the tones to pronouncing it correctly. Um, as a foreigner, you know, not a native speaker, you kind of have to do it that way unless you have a really special situation. You know, you're, you're right. But I also will say, I think it's a little bit different for every person. Yeah, I think there, there are some people that they just kind of do get that feel for the language. If I recall one of our interviews that we had, I think it was in episode four or five, Vanessa Dewey, she just kind of stopped studying tones and she just kind of got the feel for it. But it still correlates with your point, John, is that she was living in China. She was teaching English in a school, but she worked with Chinese TAs in like a Chinese school and she spoke Chinese like, you know, 60, 70 percent of the day. And so that was a really big deal for her. And she kind of picked that up. But that was probably also a lot of the same things again and again, right? It's a similar situation, similar topics of conversation. So it works the best in that kind of situation. But if, for example, you know, you join a book club and everybody reads the same book and then you talk about it, but you didn't hear the book, you know, you didn't hear people saying the words over and over again. So how are you going to say all these words that are new to you or the character names or all that? It, it just doesn't always work that well. I think this underscores that just, you know, it, tones are difficult, right? And it's difficult to, you know, memorize all, all the tones for all the characters. And there are some people who can master these pretty well. I did know one guy, he, he's an American guy, and he lived in Taiwan for a number of years, and he's now a Chinese teacher. And he says, I have memorized the tone for every character and every word that I know. And according to other Chinese speakers, uh, native Chinese speakers who have heard him speak, they're like, his Chinese is very good. He hits all his tones right. So, I mean, there are some people who I would say might be freakishly adept at Chinese in that way. But really, it comes down to, as you're pointing out here, John, is, is memory. It takes memory to remember those tones and to kind of ingrain them and kind of become more natural. Well, if you're not a native speaker and you have learned Chinese to a really high level, you, you will know the tones for pretty much everything you know. Um, as you get to the upper end of your vocabulary, the words that you don't know as well, you're a little shaky on, well, that's when your memory of the tones might be a little iffy. All right, now on to the fourth mistake, John. All right, so we got mistakes of control, mistakes of ignorance, mistakes of memory, and finally, mistakes of influence, which is kind of a weird name, and it's kind of a confusing thing in the first place. Let me read something from a blog post of mine. That's where these types of tone mistakes come from. The dialogue is, how do you pronounce the character? And it's the character for blood, right? And so the person says, xue. But the dictionary says it's either xue or xie. Oh, yes, that's right. But you just said xue, all right? So that may sound like a crazy dialogue because, you know, the native speaker, of course, they know how to pronounce their own language. Why would they change their mind? Um, and the truth is that the way that people speak Chinese and the way the dictionary says it's pronounced sometimes don't match up. And you're not going to come into contact with that for a while, and you don't really have to worry about it as a beginner or even as an elementary learner. But um, eventually, you'll start to realize that things are not always totally idyllic in, uh, in tone land, and uh, sometimes native speakers don't pronounce things exactly the same way. Now, this comes down to a lot of the non-standard Mandarin that is all around China. And if you ever are in a big city like Shanghai, that's, John, where we've uh, spent most of our time, but as well in Beijing, Guangzhou, a lot of those people, they come from different areas of China, and it's kind of a big melting pot, if you will, in the big cities. And a lot of times they bring their own accent or even sometimes words or ways of saying things from their, the region that they're in. I recall, John, one time I was out in Sichuan for a business trip. And I was out in some of the smaller areas and I was saying, hey, you know, what kind of do you have your own dialect or your own language out here? And I asked them to say some things. I just wanted to see what the difference was. And it actually sounded mostly like Putonghua, but a lot of the tones were different. And I thought that was very interesting. 
And so I'm like, wow, you know, you've got to learn some, you know, I guess different tones for different areas at times. Right. And that's definitely part of it. But there are other cases where um, it's not really a dialect thing. It's more like, you know, language is a, a living, changing thing. And that includes pronunciation. So over time, especially with the, the influence of the Internet, um, some of those pronunciations change a little bit. And dictionaries are often not updated to reflect that. So let me just give one example which is a pretty good example of something that everybody says, but dictionaries don't agree with, which is the word for download. Xiazai. That's what it says online, right? <laughs> okay, so xiazai is what no one says, but that's what the dictionary says. Everyone says xiazai. Oh. So you just kind of have to know that. Oh, well, there you go. Or if you have a dictionary that shows these alternate pronunciations. Actually, I actually have a page on the, on the pronunciation wiki that shows you some examples of these. Most of them are not low level, so you don't really have to worry about it for a while. But if you have a sneaking suspicion that what people are saying is not matching what the dictionary says, you can check this page that we have about uh, pronunciation variance. Also on that note of mistakes of influence, if you are only have the opportunity to practice your Chinese with other non-native speakers, there's frequently mistakes that might pass along to you. Uh, there's something that I had made a mistake early on was mei guo, and it's a third, second tone combination. But, you know, a common mistake is mei guo. And I actually learned that incorrectly from some friends. who Chinese people would always say, you know, where are you from? And you say, you know, I'm from America. Wo shi mei guo ren. Uh, I, I, there we go. I just did it wrong. Wo shi mei guo ren. But I would say mei guo ren. And because I heard other people saying it like that, and that influenced me incorrectly. Yeah, and don't let that stop you from practicing, but you do definitely want to check your tones, try to get feedback from a native speaker. Um, that's always a good idea. All right, so those are the four types of tone mistakes we talked about. I want to just wrap them up real quick. The first type is mistakes of control. And learning to control your tones is a long-term thing. It has steps. So expect to spend some time on that. The second type is mistakes of ignorance. So if you don't know the tones, you're probably going to get them wrong. So you got to know the tones. Uh, the third type is mistakes of memory. You're going to remember them wrong. Sometimes there's not a whole lot you can do about it, but just try to be on the lookout for things that you might be getting wrong. And number four, mistakes of influence. So this is more for higher level learners, intermediate and above. Occasionally, you'll get information which conflicts and you're going to want to explore that a little more deeply for some words. So watch out for these mistakes, guys. But the great thing is that you can learn Chinese and you can learn your tones and you can get better at this. It just takes practice, just like anything. Just keep practicing. You have your reference dictionaries on your smartphone. You can look up things anytime and just get out there and just practice. And you're going to make mistakes. That's all right. You've probably got 10,000 mistakes in you. So just start getting all those mistakes out as quick as you can. And the more practice you get in, the sooner you're going to get better and you're going to begin to really grasp this language. Practice, practice, practice. You'll get them out. And make sure you listen a lot, too. It'll, it'll all start to happen eventually. It's kind of like magic. Yes, just like magic. Kind of slow-acting magic. Very slow. Very slow-acting. It's like an enchantment, right? It just takes time. Okay, now we have a word from our sponsor. And our sponsor is? Mandarin Companion. All right. Good company. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard they're awesome. What are we talking about? All right. The book we're talking about today is The Monkey's Paw. That's right, The Monkey's Paw. Now, this is a fun story. It's, it's a horror story. It's kind of a thriller story. It's a little bit scary, a little bit freaky in there. But the basic plot is that there is this monkey's paw that grants you three wishes. But it also kind of twists around your wishes because if you wish for something, it grants it to you in a, in a bad way. And the funny thing about this story is that it's a classic story, but a lot of people know it because of the Simpsons parody rather than the original story. At least maybe people of our generation know. And that's where I first learned about this, uh, this story. And when we had, were coming up with the original stories from Man or Companion, I'm like, hey, this is a good one because it's actually a rather simple, straightforward story that we could write at a low level. And it was thrilling and entertaining. Yeah, so we didn't rip off The Simpsons. It's a classic story, and it's kind of the only one in its genre, like the thriller slash horror kind that you can really do at level one. And I got to share one thing about The Monkey's Paw. If you guys are ever on Reddit, there is a subreddit called The Monkey's Paw, and it uses the concept of The Monkey's Paw. So on it, you make a wish, and then someone tries to twist your wish around to make it bad. My favorite one on The Monkey's Paw subreddit, it's this one. It says, I wish for a turkey sandwich. 
on rye bread with lettuce and mustard. And I don't want any zombie turkeys. I don't want to turn into a turkey myself. And I don't want any other weird surprises. <laughs> and so the, the reply is, granted, but the turkey is a little dry. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your rave for today? I guess it could be. Uh, But go out there. You can get The Monkey's Paw. You can find it on Amazon, iBooks, Kobo, wherever you get your books. Enjoy it. It's a level one book written using only 300 basic characters. Okay, now we're ready for rants and raves. John, what do you got for us today? You got a rant or a rave? I have a rant. It's kind of negative, obviously, but it's something that could be useful to some of our listeners. And the rant is... Winter in Shanghai is not fun. Uh, winter in Beijing is also not fun. Yeah, It's cold. It's wet. It's not that cold, but uh, it's so uncomfortable. Uh, my family is coming to visit me in Shanghai, so we're all going to be miserable in December in, in Shanghai together. Um, if you come into Shanghai, I do not recommend you come in the winter. It's also the time when the air quality tends to be the worst. So uh, come to Shanghai. It's great, but maybe skip the winter. See, the worst thing about winter in Shanghai, it's that, yeah, it doesn't get like super cold. So if you guys are used to like tons of snow and stuff, I mean, you might get snow once in a while in Shanghai, but it doesn't stick around more than a day. But the thing is that like the buildings, there's no insulation in the buildings, right? And all the everything's made out of concrete. And so you're just like in this giant ice box and you got to turn the heater on all the time just to stay warm. And as soon as you turn off the heat, then the air gets cold and the walls are already freezing. And you're just like, <laughs> so it's like you, I feel like you can never get warm in the wintertime. I remember when I first uh, arrived in China in Hangzhou, I was teaching English and the classroom had no heat. And they actually kept the windows open in the middle of winter. And everyone wore heavy winter jackets and gloves during class. And I had to just uh, get used to that. Which is normal. I had to get used to that. Um, Fortunately, at home, I don't have to deal with that. But, you know, the beginning of the winter when all the buildings are these concrete shells, the concrete takes a while to to get really cold. So the beginning of the winter is not that bad. But once that concrete gets cold and you have like this icebox combined with the cold weather, it's kind of rough. It is. Now, I have been up north in the wintertime when there's lots of snow and it's pretty cold. You know what? They've got insulation up there. Yeah, they have central heating. And a lot of places they do the heated floor thing. And oh man, that's glorious. It's so nice. Like state-sponsored central heating. Good stuff. All right, what you got, Jared? All right, John, I have a rave for us. So about a week ago, we had the ACTFL conference, which is the American Council for the Teaching of Foreign Languages. And you have language teachers who are teaching all sorts of languages, the largest being Spanish, of course. But the second largest is now Chinese. And of course, you have German and Italian, lots of other languages there. Well, at these conferences, you also have a lot of other organizations that pull together and have their own like special meetings and stuff during that conference. And so just one I wanted to pull out here, and in case a lot of learners that may not be aware, but there are all sorts of language associations for teachers. And one I want to highlight, it's called the Chinese Language Association of Secondary Elementary Schools. This is an organization of teachers that are trying to promote, you know, and improve language education that's going on in elementary schools and high schools all around America. And the reason I want to bring this up is because on this podcast, we've talked about a lot of struggles and you've heard a lot of interviews of people who've gone through Chinese language programs that haven't been optimal. But there are a lot of great teachers out there who are really seriously dedicated to teaching Chinese and they are trying to improve the methods of teaching the language And these guys are just working hard. These are people who are dedicating their entire lives to learning Chinese and to helping other people learn Chinese. So if you've had some bad experiences learning Chinese in the past, or if you've gone through some old traditional methods, keep your eyes open. Because due to organizations like this, I mentioned their acronym is called CLASS, funny enough, they're really improving the pedagogy of Chinese education all around the world. And I've seen these people travel to different countries and do seminars and do all sorts of training. So it's getting better. It gives me a lot of hope because I'm even five years and 10 years from now, the quality of Chinese education is going to continue to improve. And we hope to be part of that. And we are. And that's great. It's actually, I, I had got some feedback from some teachers who were there and we, we had donated some books to them. And, you know, the people had a lot of questions about it. So more and more teachers are also finding out the importance of reading in Chinese And they're finding about our graded readers and they're finding other reading materials. And just the more that people read in Chinese at their level, it's going to help them improve their Chinese at a quicker pace. And they're going to be able to speak better Chinese sooner. So there's my rave for class. 
and for other organizations like them too. There's other ones like that. I'm sure there might be, if you're not in America in your home country, there's probably other organizations like this who are also trying to promote uh, and improve Chinese education. So I guess shout out to them. And that is my ray for these types of organizations. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to the CLTA, the Chinese Language Teachers Association. I, I know quite a few teachers in there and they meet at Actful too. Definitely hardworking teachers who are really giving so much time and effort to help more and more people learn Chinese. So thank you, everybody, for your hard work. So, John, are you a member of any of these organizations? You know, that's a good question. I have been a member of the CLTA, and I, I feel like I always forget to renew it. Um, I should check that. You should, John. You should check that. My name's Matthew Armstrong. Now, just so you know, he spells Matthew with only one T. I'm from South Carolina in the States, and I've been in China for about seven years. Started trying to learn Chinese for three years before I came here. I'm still working at it. While there are a lot of English teachers in China, most of those are Chinese people. I work as a CELTA tutor, so I help train teachers who want to teach English better. And the majority of the teachers I help are Chinese teachers who are teaching English. So just how good is Matthew's Chinese? Um, in 2014, I passed HSK 6 by one point. No, it really was never HSK level 6. I think I just learned how to do the test well. And it's dropped since then. Sometimes we try to demonstrate how good our Chinese is. However, I appreciated Matthew's humble perspective on how much there is left to learn despite having passed a high-level Chinese test. He also explains his motivations for learning Chinese, motivations that are different than many of the other guests we have interviewed on this show. Don't miss out on this one. Stay with us. Hey, Matthew, how you doing? Pretty good, you? I am doing well. Hey, thanks for being on our show today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. All right, well, Matthew, now we got to answer the the question. Of, like, why did you start learning Chinese? Yeah, I had experience with learning French, Spanish, and German in school, and I had been playing around with Russian. Because they're all Indo-European languages, they all have lots of similarities, and then I, I wanted to learn something that was really different, basically the writing system and also a respect for Eastern civilization. So it came down to deciding whether it would be Japanese or Chinese. I decided to go with Chinese because that's where Eastern civilization so it started in what is now present day China. You know, the that writing system, even though the sounds of it have changed other cultures and languages have adopted it over time. So I went with Chinese with the idea that I would learn how to speak it and also uh, learn the traditional form of it, not traditional characters, but like classical Chinese. Mm -hmm. That didn't do that, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole nother ball game, right? Yeah. I thought the characters would be impossible to learn, so I didn't even bother with them at first. Oh, really? Well, so what, how, what changed your mind about that? I went the maybe untraditional route with university. So I went a few years uh, after high school without going to university. And uh, I just did some random jobs in the States, labor intensive kind of work. And I was able to listen to audio a lot. So I just listened to different languages quite a bit. And I did like the Pimsleur course uh, in Chinese. So I learned quite a bit of Chinese through, I guess, listening and speaking as in not speaking as in creating sentences in real time, but following a recording for maybe a year or two. And then I was taking night school at the time. And then I transferred to a university where I could study full time and they had a Chinese program. They wouldn't let me go into an advanced, not advanced, but year two of Chinese because I didn't know the characters. So I just focused on learning the characters and not learning anything else at the time, like new words or anything. So you really focused first on learning to speak the language. And then it was years later, you said, hey, I guess I got to learn characters. Yeah, um, I just thought it was impossible to learn the characters. It's not exactly like, uh, even I'm, I'm learning Arabic right now, and I just got the abjad or the alphabet kind of figured out. But that was pretty intimidating to me, actually, even after learning several hundred or thousand characters. 
Well, Matthew, I'm interested to understand a little bit. Like, you've learned and you've studied a lot of languages. Like, why have you been so drawn to learning languages? I don't know. It's just part of how I'm wired. It seemed like I was always interested in knowing about them, but not actually studying them, as in, you know, somebody who wants to lose weight and they say they want to lose weight, but then they don't actually do it. Somebody who says they want to learn Chinese, but they actually don't stop and do it. So for a long time, I was learning a lot about different languages. And then I just kept rationalizing, I shouldn't learn another language unless I get this one figured out. I think I just enjoy them. And it's not about speaking the languages. I've come to this recent conclusion that I have no need in my life to actually speak to anybody in any of these languages, even my life in China. The extent to which I'm pushed to use Chinese is very limited. What you go to the bank, open up a bank account, use the taxi, get food from the supermarket. Oh, WeChat Pay doesn't work well. It doesn't require a high level of Chinese. So you're not exactly talking about. I don't know, a theory of relativity or something like that. And even half of the stuff that you might learn, you know, on the way to learning HSK6, if you spoke that out loud, people probably wouldn't understand you. They're not expecting a foreigner to say that, and they don't have experience with dealing with foreigners who sound differently in Chinese when they're speaking, and the written form is kind of different from the spoken variety of Chinese. I mean, they don't speak like how you would find it in a book exactly. I forget what the original question was. <laughs> the question was, what drew you to languages? What is, yeah. why you really started to learn all these languages? I started with French and then the teacher could also speak Spanish. And I thought that was cool. And I'd never seen that before. So I was just interested in that. And then I felt like I was bored with that. It wasn't exotic anymore. So I wanted to work with something else that was interesting and exotic. But as soon as you get familiar with it, it's no longer exotic and interesting. So I guess I've started and stopped quite a few languages like that. Then not too long ago, I decided, hey, I should probably work on them in the hopes of reading them more later. Okay, I kind of want to back up a little bit. I want to kind of hear a little bit more about like what you did to learn. Mm -hmm. Now, you kind of went through that pretty quick. And you said you were doing some jobs. It was just kind of, uh, you know, manual labor. So you had time to listen. So you said you were listening to some, you know, you got like the Pimsleur thing. And mm -hmm. I have to be honest, I think in one of the podcasts where I kind of trashed Pimsleur a little bit, but <laughs> I'd love to get kind yeah. of like your perspective, you know, on like, hey, you know, how did these things work out for you? What did you find were some good methods that worked for you? Yeah, I think... Have you heard of audiolingualism? Not really. No, you, maybe you could talk about that. Okay, so <laughs> that's basically what Pimsleur does. It, so it was this kind of method that was created in the United States. I guess they had to teach their diplomats a language really quickly. They had lots of drills, substitution drills and back-chaining kind of drills. So if you listen to anything that Stephen Krashen says, he says it's probably the worst things tied up into one method ever created. <laughs> 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 and guys, so you know, Stephen Krashen, he's one of the foremost researchers in language acquisition. Yeah, right yeah. On. Okay, so I didn't know this at the time, but I started with Pimsleur. I'm like, God, what is this? And I think the first lesson you had to say something like, Ni hui bu hui shuo pu tong hua, or Ni. The sentence was so long, and then the tones sounded so clear. And how could you say those tones so fast? And with the same ring as that other person. And they said, you just need to be able to do about 80%. I, I went through the first eight. And then it got to this part, like, what would you like to eat? Or it was like, ni xiang chi shen me dong xi. And that was so difficult to say. And my tongue kept tripping over itself when I tried to say it. So I had to back off of there. I went and did the Pimsleur course, which... <laughs> I've heard other language learning critics say, like, it's so frustrating, the Michelle Thomas method, because they hold your hand, and then they kind of build it up. But it goes slowly enough and helps you really think about how to put a sentence together. Uh, so it just helps you with building sentences. I want to know, like, you, so you're listening to this while you're working, right? Were you actually, while you're working, were you just speaking out loud in Chinese, just trying to repeat what you were hearing? Yeah, the 
Pimser one was kind of more behaviorist, as in it was like a lot of intense mimicking, as in they, they taught you what a whole phrase meant, and then they teach you how to manipulate the phrase, and then there were lots of drills of repeating it. Michelle Thomas had a, it's like, all right, now we want you to say it's possible. Uh, okay, now it's it's possible that I know it. It's possible that I don't know it. And then they ask a student to do that, and then you have to make the sentence, and you listen to the native speaker saying it. Uh, so, yeah, I would repeat those out loud. There was one time I was doing landscaping, and I just did that almost the whole day sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I tried with audiobooks, but I haven't done much with audiobooks with Chinese. But let's say perhaps that you've read Harry Potter in English, or you've just recently read it, or you've read a short story. You could take the translation and follow the translation and you already know the context so you'll learn a lot of vocabulary just incidentally okay so this was a little bit of the method and, and it helped you learn how to speak a bit right so what did you do to when you had to learn characters i mean how did you bridge that gap yeah so learning the characters there's a book that we used in university called integrated chinese that made you learn the first 20 radicals first I guess it had these boxes that showed you the stroke order and then you had to fill the boxes in. And I remember some of the students in the class complaining about the homework because they had to fill up those boxes for homework. <laughs> and they kept saying that they would be doing it and then they'd start forgetting what they're even doing. Or for, I think some of them would actually forget the meaning of the character as they wrote it over and over. Yeah, And others... They had us do like some kind of a uh, running dictation where we had to look at a character, then run to the board and write the character and people would be writing it so backwards. <laughs> so this is what I did. Um, I look at the character, think about the meaning, say it out loud as best as I can. And then I write it using good stroke order, nice and big pencil, not a pen with a fat eraser. <laughs> and if there's any mistake in it, I erase the whole thing. <laughs> and I, I still have to keep thinking about the meaning. There's the meaning, form, and pronunciation. This is a big thing on CELTA. So always telling people, like, you never drill something. Uh, if the students don't know the meaning of it, you don't write the word on the board before they hear it. You don't write the word on the board before they know what it means. Make sure they know the meaning first and then uh, the sound and then pronunciation. So I would say the word, think about the meaning, you know, their mnemonic devices, all that. But essentially, I would keep the meaning in my mind, say it before I wrote it, wrote it as nice as I could, said it again, write the thing five times, do the second character just like that five times, go to the first character, write it once, write the second character once, write the next character five times, go to the first character once, second character once, third character once, fourth character five times, then keep repeating until I had 10 characters one day written about 10 times. You might not be able to remember how to write it, but you're not going to forget that character after doing that. You'll know it passively enough for reading. Well, that sounds like a, it can be a helpful method. After you know about maybe a uh, hundred or maybe 200 characters, you could probably just copy it, whatever text that you're learning at the time. It would probably be just as helpful rather than doing that. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Because now you actually have some natural language. You're just copying sentences, right? Yeah. Well, I'd like to also know from your perspective, Matthew, that you're pretty much, you train teachers, right? Train, train language teachers with your job. Is that correct? Yeah. So if you're looking back on like how you started learning Chinese and what you know about best practices in education, like what would you do differently or what kind of advice would you give to someone who might even be walking along the same path that you were to learn Chinese? <laughs> it's kind of, uh, uh, because everything that we teach here on CELTA, it's like there's no point in teaching it unless the students can use it. So it's all really practical. I do see like teaching in a classroom is probably making the best of the worst situation. <laughs> As in, there's a whole group of people who don't know how to learn a language and they're all together. And there's this kind of feeling that the only exposure they'll have to the language is when they're in the classroom. 
So it'd probably be better if we talked about learning strategies and what you would do with your time outside of class. But CELT is more about, it's focused on the teacher and what the teacher does in the classroom and what the teacher does well. So there are a lot of conflicting ideas that I'm kind of required to impart on people, but I wouldn't follow myself. Like like what? Yeah, um, because... I'm interested in knowing a language thoroughly. For example, the word zipper, for example, or the word screwdriver, right? Or the word uh, weather, as in whether or not. They're not really high-frequency words exactly, but you probably need to learn them at one time or another. Uh, let's see. Advice I would give people. I wish when I started I had <laughs> really... Okay, there's some words that I think I learned the tones incorrectly for. So I think learning each word, learning what it sounds like in isolation and what it sounds like in a sentence would be good. And following more recordings and repeating more recordings, as in if you typed in shadowing, you would find somebody doing like a shadowing technique online where they repeat after a recording over top of the recording. Yeah, that could be helpful to people. Yeah, some of my tones are incorrect, actually, and it still causes breakdowns in meaning somehow. Somehow, like the speaker will have the context and <laughs> and then it will be just one small change in sound and they'll be completely confused. <laughs> uh, and people can really mess up English when they're speaking and we still understand. Um, other advice. I wish I had focused on both the traditional and the simplified forms of the writing. It's not that big of a leap, actually, but I wish I'd focused on both of them equally or more on traditional characters. Really? I mean, you know, that's interesting because usually when people ask this question, we our recommendation is, hey, focus on one because there's obviously overlap between the simplified and traditional characters, but then you know, you're having to almost duplicate your efforts on some characters where instead you could just focus on learning one of the characters instead of two characters for one. Yeah, that does make sense. As somebody's recorded Harry Potter, <laughs> the audio book, and it's on YouTube. Somebody recorded, like, actually spoke it out loud. I've been wow. trying to find a real version of it, as in there was one that I bought on Taobao, and it was, but it was abridged somehow. But somebody read that out loud. So I downloaded that, and I'm going to listen to that and read the simplified version of Harry Potter together. Then I'm going to get a traditional <laughs> character book, and I'm going to go over that thing and see how that goes. <laughs> uh, anything else I would have done differently learning Chinese from the beginning? I think not being scared about the characters and just accepting. If you've chosen to kind of marry into the Chinese language, as in... Most people, when they start learning a language, no matter what language it is, they kind of, they fail at it and they're never successful. When they do decide to choose a language, it's usually some kind of marriage as in some kind of decision like, hey, I'm going to learn this. Uh, it's important to me for some reason. So if you've decided that you're going to learn Chinese, then just accept that, I mean, 15 minutes minimum a day for the rest of your life, you're going to spend with the language. and it's going to be pleasant and enjoyable because you've chosen to spend time with that. Yeah, you'll have hit a few plateaus, probably a few dozen. If you spent 15 minutes a day with characters or 15 minutes a day with Chinese in general, then over, I don't know, a year, year and a half, then you would have a solid level in, in the language and the characters wouldn't be so bad. Lots of people are like learn the characters. I mean, they have a huge population here, and people learn characters without batting an eyelash. It's not that bad. So, I wish I'd started just earlier with it and had practiced writing every day. All right, so Matthew, I, I'm kind of interested to hear a little bit more about your perspective on Chinese and just maybe language in general, because you know, you told me a few things like, "Hey, I, I don't." really find the need to speak a lot. I like focusing on reading. I mean, you also said how you passed the HSK-6, but you felt like you really were in an HSK-6 level. Maybe you could just kind of talk about that and what your perspective is on 
you know, how you, you personally use the language and you, the need for Chinese? Yeah, I think my main practical need of Chinese is uh, somehow I get these friends here in China who are expats and have no ambition whatsoever to learn the language, then I kind of become the person with the pickup truck when it's moving day. <laughs> and it's like, you could make some Chinese friends and they could help you do this. Um, so I guess that's the most practical use that anyone could ever see from me knowing Chinese and my living in China. If English is your first language, you'll probably find that that's why you're special here, because you know English, not because you know Chinese. So I find enjoyment in either reading or if you get some nice music going and you just practice writing for a bit, no stress, just copying a text or something really nice about that, uh, like listen to some traditional kind of Chinese music and write slowly and you finish your 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, that's enjoyable. That's You could think of that as some kind of meditation or some kind of me time. I guess I, I do this for me, as in uh, if you tell somebody that you are putting in 30 minutes at least with six or seven different languages a day, and some languages you just spend 15 minutes a day or something like that, people think you're strange. And uh, <laughs> why? Or how many can you speak? How many can you know? It's like, what do you mean by speaking a language? So it's something that if you, if you are inherently interested in doing language work, people can understand one. Or if you're going to learn how to speak it, for some objective, they always ask why, especially if you're an American practicing Russian and you're in China, people are like, why? <laughs> so I've found that it's something personal and I do it for my own fulfillment. And there's no <laughs> the end goal is in I'm going to speak the language to somebody because I've had some pretty bad experiences trying to speak languages to people. It's very demotivating. If you're going to put all of your effort into being able to speak the language, it's not like Spanish where the first few years of learning Spanish, it's like, oh, you just put the O at the end of the word and you've got a Spanish word or uh, people understand everything that you say. Everything difficult is thrown at you at once in Chinese rather than in the third year of Spanish. But things get easier with Chinese. So I, I still feel demotivated when I try to speak. So I, I usually don't try to speak to people, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matthew, I want to hear your perspective on the HSK test, yeah. <laughs> right? Because you also, you know, you're working in, in education there in China. You know that there's like a lot of schools that they focus on helping students pass, you know, like English tests and maybe mm -hmm. they can pass the test, but they have, you know, maybe their proficiency isn't quite there. And I want to hear like kind of your perspective because you said, you know, hey, I passed the HSK 6 test, but... I'm really not HSK 6 level. So um, <laughs> what is your perspective on the HSK test and maybe just that in general? Yeah, so I took the HSK 5 first. I, I didn't pass that one. I should, probably should have taken HSK 4. There's a big gap between those two, of course. Then I think a year and a half later, after failing HSK 5, I took HSK 6. And I just kept telling myself that if I took the test and I, if I passed that test, that I would suddenly be it some new level of awareness. And yeah, it didn't happen like that. I just <laughs> worked hard. Then I took the test and somehow, somehow passed it. And if you look at my test score, it's something like, it's out of 300 points. You need more than 180. I got 181. <laughs> uh, now it was, it's tested. It doesn't test speaking. Of course, they have a s separate test for that. And I did take the intermediate test. There's a beginner, intermediate, and advanced test for the speaking. I took the speaking one. And there was part of it where you had to, you listen to a sentence and you had to repeat it. That was kind of strange. And you, it was into a microphone, actually. And then they showed you a picture and then you had to tell your weekend plans with about the objects in the picture. That was a bit strange. But um, HSK 6... I started taking some classes, but they couldn't put me in a class of people because they didn't have enough people at my level. So I paid for these expensive one-to-one -one classes. And then I started realizing, hey, they're just teaching me vocabulary. Like, here's another word. Here's another word. Here's another word. 
but it's kind of like dog food. Like you can't give the dog too much food. The dog will eat it up, right? But it comes to a point where there's too much dog food <laughs> and everything falls apart and you forget everything and the dog gets sick. Um, so I learned that if you're taking the test, that you get examples of the test and there's more tea and there's gen tea. So like gen tea is the real test examples used in the past. So I stopped getting the model version. So I got the gen T ones. So past examples from different years. And I just, uh, I took the test and then I looked up every single word I didn't know and wrote the meaning and sound of it on the side. And I just kept reading through them. There was a part on the HSK six where they give you 10 questions. The questions are like this. They give you four sentences and only one sentence is correct. Oh, wow. <laughs> And uh, sometimes I would give that to one of my friends and then they say, oh, then they, then they'd then they be asking their other friends or coworkers around them, which one they thought was right. They're like, it could be A or B. I said, no, it's B. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's some blog I, for HSK, I forget what it was, but they recommended that for that section, you just choose any answer and just move on, which is what I did. I guess you did good <laughs> enough, right? <laughs> yeah. The writing part of that exam, there's the written part. You can take it like a paper test, or you can take it where it's typed. Yeah, it would be really difficult to do the HSK 6 if, if you couldn't type. I did the typing one. Yeah, I think that that's standard these days. <laughs> oh, okay. That's standard now? Okay. Yeah, yeah. But So it sounds almost like you kind of gamed the test a little bit, right? You just kind of say, hey, this, yeah. figure out how to pass it, and you did it. Yeah, I got most of the points with the writing, though. Uh, I kept reading this in different readings. Like, uh, there would be a story, and then at the end of the story, it said, being a person is just like this. And then it has the moral of the story, and it's... The the way you say it, it's like do a person as in be a person is Zoran uh, So I wrote that <laughs> to sum it up. I think I got extra points for that. <laughs> also, Matthew, I want to hear a little bit about your perspective about the importance of reading in learning a language. This is something that you had mentioned to me, I think, in an email. So tell me a little bit like the importance of reading, how you think that affects the language acquisition for, you know, second language. Yeah. So um, a lot of this research that I read by somebody named Paul Nation, have you guys talked about him oh, on yeah. your show at all? Paul Nation, he's quite the man. We did actually, we did a podcast in one of John and I's discussion. Um, we, we talked about some of his research about the four strands. Oh, great. On CELTA, when I've talked to somebody about the four strands, usually people think I'm crazy. They teach reading here like they treat it like it's not intensive reading, but they it's like a reading class. But here's a text and you only know 85% of the vocabulary. Something like graded reading, ideally you have 98% vocabulary coverage. According to Paul Nation, what I've read from him, you learn a lot incidentally. So a lot of this grammar, if you learn grammar outright, uh, the more complicated the grammar is, the uh, probably least efficient time is spent on it, at least if you're teaching in class. So he recommends this balance, which is probably what you guys have talked about. Yeah. And so anyone listening, if you want to find that podcast that we talked about this, it's in our episode 13. It's the four keys of learning Chinese you need to know. So anyway, go on, Matthew. Yeah. I think the majority of the textbooks that we use, it usually has some kind of text that has uh, the language point that we're learning. So it's kind of language from text. Text is being used as a vehicle. That's fine. And I think even reading it, decoding it and understanding it, maybe writing it down later, sure. But majority of your time with the language will probably be much better spent reading graded material. So that means Hopefully you learn 100 characters. There should be 100 character graded readers and 150 now. Well, there are in English. We just created a new level for Manor Companion. It's a 150 character level. Man, it was still very difficult to write any stories. I think it's a little <laughs> easier in English because, you know, you can 
conjugate verbs and stuff. It's, it's just really hard in Chinese. Yeah. I'm sure there's like a grammar list that you probably had to stick to as well, right? Yeah. We, we kind of, John uses the Chinese grammar wiki as kind of a framework. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's a very involved process writing graded materials. It's a lot harder than it seems. When you get the end product, you're like, hey, this is simple. This is easy to read. Yeah. It takes a lot of work to write that stuff. Yeah. And then you have to make it engaging too. There's a uh... I just read this book by Sue Leather, How to Write Graded Readers, but I haven't written any yet. <laughs> the only graded reader that I think was available at the time when I was doing this was The Lady in the Painting. Uh, John DeFrancis. Oh, he wrote that. John DeFrancis. He was the man. And that stuff was handwritten in traditional characters, That old, those old readers. <laughs> um, I worked my way through that book. And yeah, I found that book really enjoyable. There weren't other really graded materials that I was aware of then. I bought these books a few years ago because I let my Chinese knowledge kind of erode. This is called Graded Chinese Reader. The Sinolingua one. Yeah, that's it. I was feeling kind of bad about my Chinese a few years ago and I bought all those books and just recently I read through them finally. <laughs> yeah, but there's no way I could have picked up a book like that. Even picking up the lady in the painting, that was very challenging to work through. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't exactly a graded reader, actually. At the time. It was good for its day, right? Um, yeah. and I guess that's one of the challenges of time. If we're going to do extensive reading, you want to read at your level, you got to have materials that are at your level. And if they don't exist or at your level, then yes. it's a challenge, right? Stephen Krashen suggested, he said, we need to get all of the, we need to get all the learners together and just give them an assignment. They need to write a really interesting story, childhood experience. And he says, one out of eight will be really good, probably. And then the teacher just takes that, cleans it up a bit. And there's graded authentic material for somebody to read. And then we collect it online. Stephen Creation, he's got a lot of lot of ideas. Yeah, he's got some ideas, yeah. <laughs> so, Matthew, I just want to get your thoughts on this. If you could go back and you could, you know, start learning Chinese over again, you know, go back in time, what would you do differently now, knowing what you know now? Knowing what I know now, I wouldn't be scared of characters. So I'd start learning characters early. I would try to find a book uh, that would teach you basic grammar and vocabulary. Every day, work 10 to 15 minutes on just learning the characters separately. And at the end of getting through one book, start getting into graded readers and using the graded reader, the 10 to 15 minutes of learning Chinese characters a day. The third part is working through some kind of textbook because the textbook itself has a curriculum. So it's like you're covering language grammar points that you need and vocabulary in a kind of systematic way. And you can get the characters that you want to learn from there for your writing section of the day. You have the engaging kind of graded readers that you're doing on the side. And make sure you reread those graded readers. Matthew, I really kind of appreciate this. And one of the things I like about the show is that, you know, we have so many learners with many different perspectives. And what I like about your story is, is that, you know, you had your goals are different, you know, than some other people. Some people want to get out there. Hey, I just want to really talk and connect with people. And it seems like, you know, one of your motivations here is like you just you find interest in the language. You just like, hey, it's, it's interesting to me just learning languages in general. And I really respect that. It's great to hear like your experience on learning Chinese and, and just about how you've done it. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. You bet, man. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, mechanic, carpenter, seamstress, pharmacist, ice cream truck driver, and that one guy named Dan. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at mandarincompanion.com. Apologies to John Cena, we just ran out of time. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself, Jared Turner, and our editor is James Harper. I'd like to thank Matthew Armstrong and my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Pasden. See you next time.